Um, it's great to talk to you virtually in this series of interviews that we're recording. Um, and at Ray TV, we try and have a, a respectful approach to the way we do these interviews. So there's going to be questions for Rover supporters and Dundee supporters um, to, to listen to. Um, first up, how are you keeping during this latest lockdown? Uh, I understand that your coaching work is on hold because of the current situation. Yeah, I'm currently um, working at Broughton High School, one of the SFA performance schools in Edinburgh. Um, so the schools are obviously that they're on. The kids are all going back on Monday for the online um, learning. So I'm just going to work out the best way to go forward with, with the SFA work at the school. So, um, so it's exciting. It's exciting. It'll be something different, but um, it's just just try to get get the best um, plan ahead for for making it worthwhile for the for the players that come along um, to the performance school. Oh, you're right, yeah. So it's normally be keeping you busy, but it's a different kind of busy, isn't it, because of the current situation? It is, yeah. It's, we're on the pitch every day. Normally on the pitch every day at the school, we've got great facilities, so it'll be, it'll be different for the players. It'll be a lot of online stuff. It'll be analysis. It'll be um, just various tasks um, that we can do on the screen. Right, OK. Let, let's get into it then. Um, we're going to go right back to 1983. Um, Gordon Wallace... Um, somebody else with connections to Dundee, he was your first Rovers manager and he signed you as a teenager from Melbourne Thistle. Uh, you've been an S form at Hibs, but you came to the Rovers um, and it was not long after Rovers had missed out on promotion to the Premier League in 1981. Club was in a wee bit of a decline. Um, before we f- talk about your first strike partner, or your main strike partner at the Rovers, tell us about some of the experienced players you went into the dressing room with at Starks Park. Guys like Dan Arkert, uh, Chris Candlish, uh, Toa Houston, and so on. Yeah, no, it, it's, it was a great opportunity for me. I, I thought my chance had gone to to play professional, or, or at that time it was part time professional. And um, so I, I I got the opportunity from Gordon Wallace, um, and and I I was just wanting to make sure I, I took the best opportunity and give him my best shot. And um, just coming from the boys' club, um, it was a, a step up. And, and definitely, whenever I went in the door, um, I, right away I knew what professional football was like with, with the guys that you mentioned, Donald Durkart, Toa Houston, Chris Canlis, Craig Robertson, um, the two midfield players, Jimmy Marshall and Jimmy Kerr. Uh, they were fantastic guys to, for me to go and learn how to play football. Uh, I really got a fright uh, the first couple of training sessions when, when you make a mistake at, at that level. Um, I soon told you, I, mean, I, I played five games in my first season, but I was really got in, introduced to, to, to that sort of standard. But what a learning curve it was for me. Um, and in the rest of my Rovers career, I, I played most of the games and scored a lot of goals. But, a lot of goals, but that was due to the, what I learned from these guys when I went in the door. Yeah, I, I can imagine they took no prisoners, some of those, some of those older, more experienced heads. Yeah, well, they, they, right away I knew, if I, if I missed a chance, it, um, in the game, I got told about it. Different at boys' club level, you're just learning. But whenever I gave the ball away or I missed a chance, and Donald Urquhart or Toe Houston were, were right on my back to say that's not acceptable. Uh, if you give the ball away cheap in a game, it, it means they've got to defend. So they didn't like defending. So you, I soon learned to, how to protect the ball and, and take more of my chances that came along. Um, but Jimmy Marshall and, and, and Jimmy Kerr in midfield, Jim Marshall says to me one day, he made a great run beyond when I when I had the ball and I didn't I didn't give him it and he, he came up to me and says Do you think I make these runs for the for the good of my health? I says when I make a run like that, I expect to get played through. Um, so they soon, they soon tell you it's no it's no a development or it's no a unlucky. It's it was real business and I, I I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot from it. It's brilliant. It was brilliant for me to get signed with Gordon Wallace, but Gordon Wallace was only at the club for two weeks. And he got, a, he got a coaching job at Dundee United. So he signed me. Two weeks later, he, he had got this full-time job at Dundee United. So thankful that he gave him a chance, but I didn't really get that much chance to work with him. He was away, and, and Dick Campbell, and, and then the new manager was Bobby Wilson, who, who had real confidence in me and, and believed in me. Um, so I was, I was lucky. Lucky I got Gordon Wallace seen, seen enough of me to sign me. Uh, and then lucky at the manager that came in had a, a belief in me it, it, it gave me opportunities to, to play um, and Dick Campbell was Dick Campbell was a 29 year old he just finished playing um, and what a character he was and obviously went on to have a, he's having a brilliant managing career but that was the, the, the young Dick Campbell the young coach Dick Campbell was brilliant he was great in the changing room 
Um, you could just see then he was going to be his own man as, as, he, as he got older. Yeah, uh, you've obviously covered my next. This is the great thing about these, uh, these interviews. A lot of the time when you're talking about football, the way things flow, the next question is already answered by by you, the, the responder. So you've just answered my next question about Dick Campbell and Bobby Wilson. So it was good. It was good hearing you say that um, Bobby Wilson gave you great support. You know, he believed in you as a player. Um, it's important to get that support from your manager, whatever level, whatever level you're at. Definitely, as, as a young player, when a, when the manager leaves and, and somebody else comes in, you just you're, you're hoping that. And they like what they see and they, and, and they, they give you opportunities. But I, w- I was a left winger at that stage. So and Bobby Wilson used to, used to encourage me to, to, to take players on and get crosses in. And, and then he also introduced me to play striker as well. He, he thought with the, with the attributes I had that I would be better through the middle. So it was thanks to Bobby. I, I probably was more of a striker towards the end of my Rovers career. I started off as a winger, which mm. people can't believe. I was just just positive and, and put a lot of crosses in. But when Bobby made me, uh, well, the smudger up two up top, then, then that sort of gave me a, more opportunity to score goals and, and, and sort of more freedom to play. And, and that was thanks to, to Bobby to give me that chance. Yeah. And it was a bit of a challenging time at the Rovers. I mean, in, at the end of your first season, um, relegation to the, the bottom division of Scottish football came about. You know, we did our, we did our job. We beat Meadowbank. Uh, but Air beat the champions Dumbarton on the last day. Did you feel that that relegation was coming, or did it was it a genuine shock to you when when we went down? It was it was probably the, the middle of the season of our forum. We, we probably didn't deserve to to stay up. We, we come with a late run and we, we, we finished the season strong, but the damage was probably done early on. Um, so it was a massive blow to to sign and then be relegated in your first season. But in hindsight, it's, it's probably it's probably helped me. And it probably helped the club because it was a sort of rebuild job, um, rebuilding job with, with what happened. And I, I think the club in, in the years after that seen the benefit and, and it probably helped in the long run. Yeah. Uh, you've talked about your, your t- some of your teammates already, uh, the older experience heads. Um, you made your debut coming on as a substitute, substitute for uh, Paul Sweeney, who was my personal favourite player. Uh, from, from that era and, and is still pretty much my uh, favourite player. But the player that we are going to talk about next, obviously, your strike partner, Paul Smith. He's, he's, he's back at the Rovers. He's been back at the Rovers with John now as assistant manager after a previous successful stint there. And something that's been written about you and you've said a lot is that strike partnerships throughout your career have been really important to you and you've been, in a sense, lucky with who you've been paired with. Um, Paul was that wee bit older than you, but two and a bit years older than you, uh, and you seemed to head it off straight away when you were put up top together. How did he bring the best out in you, and how did you bring out the best in him, do you think? Yeah, I, as you said earlier, I, I've been lucky. I've had good strike partnerships over the years. Uh, we've have, we have really knocked it off with, with, with guys I've played with, and Smudger was the first one. Smudger, um, the two of us just, just held off together. Uh, two Edinburgh lads, we travelled together. Uh, we got on well off the park. He was he was some lad. He was a good he was a good laugh. All the all the Edinburgh boys uh, used to love Smudger. Smudger was a probably the older one. It all travelled, and we actually got a rifle or minibus. Smudger used to be the minibus driver as well. We all used to meet at Haymarket, uh, and that was some some great journeys we had coming across. Um, so we got on great off the park, but he was he was just ideal for me. I I, I had another running for him, and he scored all the goals. That was the sort of partnership. I, I, done, I run into the channels, I done, I done sort of that side of the work, but Smudger was a great finisher uh, and great linking up. So the, the players over the years, it, it was probably similar. It, it, they were always great finishers that I played with, and Smudger was the same. Uh, used to score some great goals and uh, make it look easy. And, all, and also his experience helped me as well. He was, he was a quite confident lad. He was always talking. He would, like the other guys, he would tell you if he wasn't happy with something. Yeah. So I had a, a total respect for him and, and I've got on great with him ever, ever since the Rovers days. Uh, he's always been a, a lad that I've got on great with and I've, I've watched his career with, with interest as well. So yeah, yeah. I, was lucky, I was lucky to put him him. Yeah, and, and with lots of strike partnerships, you know, the high profile ones like Tosh Akin, Keegan, way back, uh, 
years ago for Liverpool. They always they talked about this almost telepathic understanding they had, and they tried to do experiments on those two. And there was no actual telepathy. But did you do you feel you had some sort of you you had a good a great understanding of Paul's game and and him of yours? Probably, probably just just something. That it's it's the same way when I when I partnership with Tommy Coyne at Dundee with Smudger. It just sort of happened. It's not something that you that you work out. No, we're only part time, so it wasn't as if we were doing it on the on the training field every day. It's just one of these things that our attributes both we helped each other. I, I was good in the air. And I would I would get flick ons and Smudger would anticipate and he would take chances. Uh, I would put some crosses into the box and Smudger would always be at the end of them. So. It's difficult. It's difficult to say how it, how it always works out well, but um, it was it was just one of these things that you, the attributes are, are probably opposite. Say we're probably opposites. I had some good points that uh, um, Smudger never really liked to get in, but running behind that wasn't his game. But I used to love that, and Smudger used to love any type of finishes, no edge of the box or in the box. So, um, so just when it, again, it's one of these partnerships that just works out great when the two years get put together. Yeah, and indeed that first season in the in, in the old second division, um, you, you know the partnership really hit off. Uh, Forty one goals shared between you, um, with you getting twenty two of those goals. Um, what but also what what, to, what I want to focus on is that um, in that season there were two wins away to Albion Rovers, where Rovers scored a total of ten goals. You got two hat tricks in two games, and Smudger scored a hat trick as well. How did you? Guys, agree who got the match ball the day that you both scored a hat trick. Um, was there a plan? Um, Smudge has talked about it before, but was there a plan? It's not only no you guys. No certain strikers would, would, would imagine would happen. It's, it's not. It, I don't think anybody at, at any team speaks about if the both of you get a hat trick the same day. It, it just it never happens. But um, but it did happen with us when when we won six 0 and the two of us got a hat trick. Uh, but also. It, so I learned for that. Yeah, you always say you always say you learn for your experiences. So I learned for that because Smudger put the rules in at the end of the game to say that the oldest gets the ball. So he he won that battle. So Smudger's got the got the hat tricks for the, the ball for the hat tricks against Albion Rovers. But in a game in a game after that, we beat Stenhouse Muir nine two, and I scored five, and Smudger got a hat trick. So I quickly say that the player that scores the most goals gets to keep the ball. So. So we actually got evens on each other. We got we've got a ball each. So, uh, but it's nothing you can plan. You never you never plan for for teammates scoring hat tricks in the same game. But the two guys, it worked out all right. We've got a ball each. Yeah, those two six no those two six nil wins and a nine two one are still talked about by Rovers supporters to this day uh, of of my age and older. Um, and you know, you know, mentioned the, uh, the, that, the Stenhouse Muir game, it just shows you the inconsistent and the, the, top, the sort of team we were. Uh, we won the Saturday, I think it was the 2nd of November, we won 9 2 against Stenhouse Muir. I'm from Edinburgh, we're playing Medibank Thistle the following week, so I've got all my, my mates telling, it, telling them how good a team we are, you need to come and see us hammer Medibank Thistle. And do you remember what the score was that game the week after? Aye, another 6 0. We got beat six 0 Aye. We got, we got no. beat six 0 So that, that, we won nine two one Saturday, and then you go the following week. I've got my mates coming to the game to say, right, we're going to this nine two against any. We're going to hammer made a bank, and then you beat six 0 That is that is summed up the inconsistency of the team. How how you can go face a high to to a low on the next Saturday? Must have been frustrating as well as anything else. Uh, I, I was frustrating for the manager. I can remember. The, the, the thing I remember for that was with Frank Connor and Terry Christie, two two of the most experienced managers in the league, coming to go at each other because Terry was was winding Frank up. It's no really? it's no standing we were playing this week, Frank, and Frank was taking the bait. Um, but no, these two, two great managers, but the two of them were, were at, at each other's throats the whole game. Um, the following season, season eighty five eighty six, um, it brought um, a, a twenty a, another twenty plus goal. 21 goals for you uh, in that season. At that point, were you made aware of any interest from clubs higher up the leagues or or further afield? There was there was talk. There was always there was always talk. You know, when I was scoring goals like that, there was clubs looking. But I find that I find that the closest that I got to leaving before I did leave was that uh, Hearts were interested. Believe it or not, Hearts had put a bid in, but 
the Rovers had, had up to bid at the last minute because I used to work years later I worked with Walter Borfick who was the first team coach at Hearts and he had said that Alec McDonald had put a bid in at 25 grand uh, and it had been accepted and then the day after Rafe Rovers had went back and said no we want 30 grand and Hearts and Hearts he's not forget it so that was the closest I, I was getting to to leave in uh, and until until the the following season I got the chance to go to Dundee so that, but there was always rumours that I was scoring goals but it must have been something that was putting the clubs off, so I didn't get the chance to go full time until Dundee came in. You mentioned Frank Connor there. 1986, Frank Connor arrives in the March, and it really helps you step up a level uh, regard as, with regards to your preparation for games, You know your mental attitude and your focus. Um, Frank is universally respected within football. Uh, he's ruthless, efficient and straight-talking. Um, to say the least. Um, how big a role in your development did Frank play? And was he, was he, a, was he a good manager to play for? The, the best thing that happened to me, I know, I know it was great to get my chance to play for, for the Rovers with Gordon Wallace and, and Bobby Wilson. Bobby Wilson was a good manager, but Frank was just, he just gave the whole place a shake. He was just, just his manner, the way, the way he expected things to happen, the, this, his discipline, um, the way he treated players, he just, he just gave me the kick up the backside that I needed because I was part time for five years at that point and probably probably not going to get a chance to go full time. But just the, the difference Frank made to my game, how I, how I prepared, how I worked harder, how I didn't make set, um, well, I didn't make as many mistakes as I was making, um, getting me really concentrating on my game. Um, but the discipline, the, the, the making sure that you were preparing for games and what you were doing after the games and you were preparing for the next game and just you've been at you had been at other big clubs and um you'd worked for the top players so just I just learned so much from him and he just gave me that as I say that that be boost to going to go to the next level which I got my chance soon after. Yeah, yeah. And it was at the start of that season, eighty six, eighty seven, you know, uh, you played twenty games, you know, cup games and friendlies and league matches. Uh, and you scored 19 goals. Um, Frank had signed a, a number of experienced players like Hamish McAlpine, Ian Gordon, uh, Colin Harris. And the team was like, they were looking good, fancied for promotion. Um, and I remember being personally surprised that the transfer fee um, was only £35,000 uh, from Dundee. Um, what did you feel about the transfer fee? And were you nervous about making the step up to the Premier League even with your good goal scoring rate, it's it's the, probably the, the chance I've been I've been waiting for it. I've been working in the Edinburgh office for five years. I've been I'm loving my time at the Rovers, but uh, everybody everybody was wanting to try. Uh, most players would want to have a go at full time football, so this was my opportunity. But it just, it just happened so quick. It, it just I didn't even think it was going to happen when it did because, uh, as I say, it was December, middle of the season. Um, nothing really happened in the transfer market until it was a Friday night and the game was the Rovers game was off with the frost and I got a phone call from Frank saying um, and his exact, exact words were when he phoned me he says what are you doing tonight I goes usual nothing on a Friday night he says do you want to play at Parkhead tomorrow and I says is there a game on he says Dundee Dundee have come in we are we are bid but you need to sign before 12 o'clock tonight uh, and you'll be in the squad for Parkhead tomorrow, they're playing Celtic. So I says, and I thought he was winding me up, I says, well, six o'clock now, he says, well, you need to get your shell over to Starts Park, I'm meeting Jockey Scott, if we can get the thing sorted out, then you'll, the registration will go through for midnight, and you'll be in the squad tomorrow. And that was it, I got my, I didn't, I wasn't driving at the time, my dad had to give me a lift through to Starks, um, and I met Jockey Scott, uh, Frank was there, we got the deal sorted out, and it was through in time for me to be uh, in this, the Dundee squad for the December, I'll never forget it, December the 7th, uh, 1986, played it, a suburb for Dundee against Celtic at Parkhead, and it just happened that quick, and that was, a, that was the opportunity I was looking for. I love my time at the Rovers, but um, I think Frank was desperate for me to go as well, because he had another couple of players lined up. So, yeah. for, for, for he wasn't, it, it, not he was wanting to lose me, but he just says that this is going to be good for the club as well. Good for you to go full time, but he had a couple of players lined up to come in, so it was, it was working great for, for both parties. And it seemed to work out well because 
we got promoted at the end of the season, on the last day of the season, uh, and your Dundee career uh, took off. Um, when you arrived at Dens Park, you were paired with their other new signing, uh, Tommy Coyne, who you mentioned all, already. In that first half season together, um, playing at a higher level, um, you scored 28 goals between the two of you, uh, and, he, and he seemed to complement your game as well, almost instantly. Um, did you remember having to work on that partnership and training, or did it just happen like that? It was, it was similar to the smudger. Um, the two of us, th- this time we did, we did work more together, but we were full time, so we were, we were working day in, day out. On, and especially, with, again, we had good managers and coaches. We had Jockey Scott and Drew Jarvie, who were both top strikers. So all their, all their training was geared towards crossing and finishing and, and, and shooting. So Monday to Friday, um, myself and Tommy would work together, uh, and, and that helped. But again, it just worked with Smudger. We had attributes that complemented each other. And with Tommy was similar to Smudger. Tommy would just love loved finishing, he loved getting the end of crosses. Didn't like so much the running into the channels, but but great at linking up, great at bringing other players into the into the, into the game. Um, and it just happened again. Like like murder, it's it's just funny how, how these things work out. You get the ideal partner. And we just I, I, I would never class myself as a goal scorer up. I, I was always um like sort of making goals with flip ons and creating crosses in. But with Tommy I just seem to I, I seem to get my fair share of goals as well. So it's just it's just difficult to put your finger on it, but it's just it's great. It's great when it, it works out. You, you two players can work too well together and get get um either score goals or make goals. It can't be down to luck, you know, or, or good fortune that you know you get paired with a striker that you hit off with two clubs in a row. Well that, that it's, it's probably it, su- it suited me to, to have great finishers alongside me. I would never class myself as a good finisher, but for me I, I got a lot of praise because I would I would do a lot of the work where I would hit bylines and put different types of crosses in, and I, I thought that was the easy part of the game. So I got a lot of, I got a lot of praise for that. But I learned when I was watching how Tommy Coyne and Smudgers how how easy they make it looking to finish. So obviously I was watching them and learning as well. So I eventually got my my, my own scoring record improved as well. With that, we're watching these guys, uh, even in the other guys at the club, like Graham Harvey and Ross, Ross Jack. Um, so day in, day out, I was, it was a learning curve for me. So I was learning all the time. So and it, helped, it helped the other part of my game, which was trying to score goals as well. Yeah. One for the Dundee supporters. Um, you, 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 you relished, despite saying you're not a goal scorer, naturally, you seem to relish scoring in derby matches with uh, f- Scored, goals scored in four wins over Dundee United in your time at Dens Park uh, when United had a team that were competing at the highest level uh, and in Europe. Did playing against that higher standard um, of defender bring out the best in you, did you think? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like, you talk about United defenders with Malpass and Neri and uh, Hegarty, um, top defenders, John Holt would play right back at times. Um, so you always always had to be up for for playing these games against the top defenders. And United were a top team in that that, that part of the eighties um, in Europe every season. So it was great. It was great derby games. I love playing them. And and looking back at my scoring record, we scoring a hat trick in a derby and uh, beat them at Tandice a couple of times and beat them at Dens. Um, and it was always Tommy. Tommy would be an ex United player as well, so he was definitely up for it. Um, but it was good. It was a good Dundee team. It was a, it was a great, a great Dundee team at that time with, with Jim, um, Stuart Rafferty, um, John Brown in midfield, Tosh McKinley, and and the man that helped me the most was Jim Duffy, the captain. He was brilliant with me. That was my first full time move, and Jim Duffy just really helped me to set onto the club. So it was a great, it was a great team. I'm lucky not to win anything. We got beaten the semis of the Scottish with United, um, but that team were unlucky not to win anything. We weren't too far away in the cup competitions and we finished in the second half of the league um, three or four seasons. And, and, and within time, uh, Tommy Coyne moved on to Celtic for, uh, for half a million pounds. Um, overall, you scored at a rate of one goal every 2.6 games for Dundee. Uh, and when Dundee were relegated, you stayed on at Dens Park to try and get the club promoted again. Uh, was that an easy choice to stay rather than jump ship, as some might have done? Um, no. To be honest, 
I'm, I'm, I'm a loyal, I'm a loyal player to the clubs. I was loyal at the Rovers. It's, it's, I didn't ask for a move at Dundee because I was thankful for the Rovers giving me the chance to play professional to start with. So I have been loyal, and I didn't ask to leave Dundee. Dundee gave me the chance to full time, so it wasn't as if I was knocking the door to to leave. It, it was just the, the money situation that I was sort of asked to leave uh, because it. The, they failed to get, they got relegated and failed to go up in one season. So I think the money situation was at a stage where they had to sell somebody for to stay full time. So the chairman at the time, Angus Cook, had, had actually says to me, unfortunately, I'm not giving you a choice. It, it, you'll need to go. There's two clubs that are, are willing to pay the money I'm looking for. Hibs and Aberdeen. Um, so it's up to you to pick what club you want to go to, but you need to leave. So I think Dundee fans knew that. Knew it was in the because we're in the, the, the sort of the league below the Premier League, I was asking to leave. I was loyal to the club, and uh, I was never going to, to jump ship. And they gave me the chance, but I think it was the, the money they got for Hibs who I went to and helped the club stay full time for that extra season, and they managed to get promoted. Yeah. Um, so, so again, it worked out for both parties. Yeah, and in that in that last season at Dundee, you paired up with another strike partner, uh, Billy Dodds, who went on to do. You know some some interesting things in his career. He did quite well out of playing with playing with you. Um, the move to Hibs. I mean, you finally got the chance to sign for the team you'd always supported, and as well, you know, as as a player who's loyal, loyal, it brought your current team, Dundee, a decent transfer fee, and the Rovers a twenty percent sell-on fee. Couldn't have been better for Hibs, man. I, 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 that's just something. Uh, it just happened um, out of the blue. In, in this case, it was going to be, I never thought I would go to Hibs because Hibs were having a lot of financial trouble at that time. Um, and even though I was told I'd had to leave Dundee, I didn't ever think it would be, it'd be Hibs I'd be going to. Uh, and then the, the bonus, uh, uh, the amount was agreed. And I didn't really know that until in, at the time, but since then I've known it, that the Rovers got 20%. I didn't know that. So it was great to hear that the Rovers... And that, that would be down to Frank putting that deal in when I left in the in the first place to if, if I ever moved on that they were going to get a twenty percent net. So that was good to hear. Um, and Dundee, the money they got, it, it helped them stay full time, uh, and it, and it got me my move to the team I supported. So it, it all worked out well for all, all clubs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, highlights of your time at Hibs were fifty nine goals. Um, including one in the cup final against uh, a team from the West of Fife, um, Dunfermline, um, uh, which us Rovers fans, we, we looked on that one with a lot of pride as well, because not only was it the Pars losing in a cup final, but it was one of our guys uh, scoring the scoring the goal. Um, did you think of the Rovers when you scored at Hamden versus Nori McCarthy, Davy Moyes and Ian Westwater and co? I, I, was, never, I was never a part Pars lover after my time at the Rovers because it, it was, that was a big derby game. So you, you tend to like Dundee or the United. I'm not a United fan and, and Rovers and Dunfermline. So I was I was delighted that we Dunfermline in the final uh, and to put one over on them as well. To, to, I knew the Rovers fans would be, would be happy with that. Uh, and also, it was funny that Jockey Scott was actually managing Dunfermline. Mm. So it was just funny how football works out. The man that gave him a chance to, to go full time as a manager of uh, he done Fairman at the time as well, so and his yeah. assistant was Gordon Wallace, wasn't it? Gordon Wallace who signed me for the Rovers, so it's funny how you all Scotland Scotland's like that. You all, you all end up against each other or back with the same club where you met with players and managers. And it's funny how it all works out. But no, it was great. It was great to, to get the goal, the second goal, and, and I knew the, the Rovers fans would be happy with that. Yeah. Looking at the current Dundee squad, um the comparison I've made is that Hibs manager Alex Miller, when you were there, he had lots of experienced players like John Burridge, uh, Murdo McLeod, um, and you joined in, you know, and you were part of that squad as well. And in the current Dundee side, they've got a hugely experienced player in Charlie Adam, uh, a player that seems to create time and space for himself just with his knowledge of the game. How important is it to get that mix of experienced and younger players uh, working together in a football team? Yeah, no, it's massive. Charlie Adams has been a great, a great signing for Dundee. I watched him against Harps the other night there, uh, and the delivery he puts in the box, uh, he, he's going to be massive for Dundee. If he can keep fit and play most of the games, he'll, he'll go a long way to, to getting him a, a few points. So, no, it is, and Dundee have also got, have got a good, good young players who are just starting out in the game. So, 
Um, the, the likes of, of Charlie Adam and, and McGowan um, will be a big, a big help for these young players that are playing in the team. Um, so uh, as, as long as they can keep fit, McGowan and, and Charlie Adam, I think, will be big players for them this year. And, and the couple of signings they've brought in as well, a big striker um, who scored a hat trick the week before. Is it oh, uh, yeah, they'll, 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 be, they'll be not far away, Dundee. Uh, great result against Hearts, and I think they're on a good run now, so they'll get a lot of confidence for that. Uh, big games coming up as well, they've got big games coming up, so um, over the next few weeks, that'll be a big, uh, be a big de- um, decider on how, how well they can stay at, at close to Hearts, and maybe put a good run in to, to, to get promotion or into the playoff spot anyway. Of course, we can't talk about your career um, overall without mentioning your Scotland cap versus Northern Ireland in a friendly at Hamden. Uh, and it was for Rovers fans, you know, we all thought about that time six years previous when you played against Queen's Park alongside the likes of Jim Marshall, Chris Candlish, Paul Smith and others. Um, did you feel it was a fair reflection on your abilities to only get to play once with the likes of McCoist, Malpass, Goff, Strachan, McAllister, McLear and so on? Yeah, a lot. I loved the opportunity. I never like like my move to the Rovers or my move to Dundee or Hibs. I just you just didn't think it'll happen. And then to get a Scotland cap was a, a million miles from what what I thought. I was just happy to stay to play professional. But uh, whether I was scoring goals and and probably I was playing well week in week out in the top league. So the, pre- the press were beginning to put my name forward rather than anything else. So I think. I think the, the manager, Andy Roxford, was under pressure, but my performances were, were maybe getting me mentioned. So when I looked at the list of strikers, I thought there was no chance. When I seen it, McCoyst and Mo Johnson and Kevin Gallagher was scoring goals down south and Gordon Dury, uh, we Robo at Hearts. There was, there was probably the strongest position to get a game for Scotland. So for me to get, get included in a squad, I was delighted then to, to start. When I heard the manager, the manager saying, Four four two and up front I'll be McCoyst and right was uh, something I didn't think I would ever hear. So it was it was a great experience. It was actually Gordon Strachan's fiftieth cap. That was my my only cap. So it was a presentation after the game where Gordon Gordon obviously gets a special medal for his fiftieth cap. So it was great to be involved. Gary McAllister, Gary McAllister and Brian McClare and uh, all the top players that were playing in England at the time, and I was in amongst it. And for that one cap, it was it was a great, great experience for me, and it's something that I'll never take away. I've got my cap to show my boys and things like that, so really enjoyed it. Yeah, and and and, and Andy Rocks, the manager at the time of Scotland, Andy Rocks, were um, you know maligned by some people, but um, in in that one in that one cap and those training sessions leading up to your one cap, how do you find him as a manager? How do you how do you take to him? Yeah, I, I thought it, it was one of these ones that's not been a top player in his day, but uh, he earned the respect with, with his coaching ability and Craig Brown was his assistant and Craig Brown was great. He was, he was great with the players and he proved that with, a, with the managerial career he had as well. He's been on and managed top clubs and players used to love working with Craig Brown. Randy Rocks probably went down probably the UEFA or FIFA route. He, he's been involved in that side yet since his Scotland days, so he has been involved in the game at a top level. Um, so that proves that uh, these guys are they know the game and um, and even my one experience here he been involved in it and you, you knew that he knew his stuff and the players were listening to him so um, it was it was good to be involved and, and see how that how it works at the international scene yeah, yeah. To be involved and see how they, all these guys who are I used to watch on TV Gordon Striker and McCallister playing the top clubs in England and you know, they were actually a teammate for the day it was good. Yeah, it must have been. It must have been someone else. Um, uh, obviously, you, you were at Hibs for several seasons after your your, your Scotland experience, um, and when you eventually left um, Hibs, it was in a in a deal to come back to Raith Rovers alongside Ian Cameron, uh, with Tony Rouge going the opposite way. Um, by this time, obviously, Jimmy Nicholl was in his second spell in charge at Raith Rovers. Um, tell us about your time at the Rovers, second time around for you. Yeah, uh, it was full time. It was full time at the Rovers, so it was, it was funny going in every day. Uh, from my, from my, my early 80s, I was going there Tuesday night and a Thursday night, um, training at Beveridge Park. And that's in the early 80s, and then to come in to be full time and 
working in, in with a management team of Jimmy Nicholl and Alex Smith and taking the youth team with Terry Butcher and John Brownlee. It was an incredible management team they had and they were all, all great, great in their own ways. They're all, they're all different characters in their own way. Um, so Jimmy Nicholl was brilliant, the, the best man manager. Uh, the way he gets the best out of his players and I, I loved the way he worked. And Alex Smith was 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 a more serious and more tactical. Um, Terry Butcher had just no longer been the England captain. His first managerial job, I think, might have been Sunderland or Coventry and he had, he had just finished up there. And Jimmy Nicholl had brought him into the Rovers. Um, so to have the, the England captain taking the youth players at the Rovers was it was a brilliant experience for them and John Brownlee, who who, of, who was one of my Hibs heroes when I watched Hibs in the seventies. He was yeah. the, he was a flying fullback, so it was just, it was amazing to go in every day, and that was the four guys that you were working with. Uh, I, I probably would have liked to have been fitter. I didn't didn't get the best. They didn't get the best of me the second time round. Uh, hamstring problems and things like that. But I loved it. I loved being back. I had there was great teammates. Kevin Twaddle. We Dargo and used to travel with these guys. They were Edinburgh lads. Used to travel with these guys. Uh, Nipper Thompson, Scott Thompson, um, and and Peter Duffy was my strike partner. Uh, the times that I played, um, so it was not it was good. It was a good experience. Squad just just didn't they, didn't they do what I wanted to do, and that was to, to try and get the Rovers back in the Premier League. That was Jimmy's aim, and then they didn't they quite uh, manage it. And again, I was, as I say, I had a lot of hamstring problems, so I didn't do as well as I. As I, as I wanted to. We're getting towards the end of the interview, Keith, but uh, a couple more things that I want to ask you about. Um, the Hall of Fame process for each club um, has been kind to you in many ways. I think, to, to my mind, you're one of, I think you're the only player that's been inducted into the Hall of Fame for three separate clubs, obviously Rovers, Dundee and, and Hibs. Tell us about the emotions attached to these awards. How much do they mean to you as a former player of those three clubs. So I go back to the very start when I'm when I'm playing at Melbourne Thistle and I'm being released for Hibs at 16. I go to Melbourne Thistle and I'm thinking to myself, that's my that's my full time, my, my chance of playing football uh, professional away. I'm, I'm playing under 18 boys club, and then to look at your career at the other side of it, and you've went to the three main clubs who have given you the chance, Rafe, Dundee, and Hibs. But to look back and, and find out that you're in the Hall of Fame, you're part of the club's history, is, is unbelievable. So proud just to play for the clubs, to get the chance to play for them, but then to get inducted into the Hall of Fame and, and all that was involved in these nights. Uh, the, the only thing is that uh, my dad my dad's seen me um, get inducted to, to the, the um, Dundee and the Hibs. He, he, he passed away and he wasn't at the Rovers one out, and I've loved that because the Rovers one's probably the biggest night of the year. Mm. Uh, um, so he would have loved that idea of it. It was great. He, he loved, he loved um, seeing me get involved in the other two clubs, but he always said that it'd be great if you could have got in the Rovers Hall of Fame. Uh, and it happened when he was away, but when he passed away, but um, he, he would have been so proud. My mum was there. My mum was at the Rovers one. She was, she was she's just turned 80. Um, and these are the these are the nights that, that you thank all your family because they, they back you right through all the years. My dad used to take me all over the country. I used to have trial games when I was seventeen before I signed for the Rovers. So it's great when you can invite them to these sort of nights and then be part of it. And then and just a sort of thanks to to the to them for all the effort they put in. And then, um, and they're so proud of themselves that they're that I'm actually involved in three Scottish clubs as part of their history. Uh, and in many ways, those Hall of Fame inductions are, are as much for you know, your mum and dad as well as as, we, as you, because because the, the sacrifices they made. Something that something that um, gets remarked on, on at Rovers about the current crop of youngsters we've got. You know, we've got a young lad, Dylan Tate, who has made it into the first team at Wraith Rovers, down to his own abilities, but also down to the input and the effort of his his mum in particular, working shifts and running into training all over the country and, and so on. It's, it's very much a, a family thing, isn't it? Definitely. I totally agree with that. The amount, the amount of... Like I, 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 I'm involved in the in the youth side. I see a lot of the... My, my, my young boys at Hibs now as well. And you and you see how much parents put into their kids getting to training, sitting in the car park, especially these days. Now they can't see the games. They're, they're travelling mm. all over the country. 
uh, just for the for the, their son to get our daughters to get the best opportunity. So when when things go well for the son or daughters, then definitely they, it's a chance to thank the parents for all the work that they put in and the hours that they put in, just to give you the opportunity to train and, and play games. So I was definitely the same, even though it was all these years later. I was so thankful for my dad who, who took me. I go, I used to get trials at. Uh, um, our growth, I got turned down with our growth Monday night, reserve league East games, got out our growth against Forfa. My dad would leave his work early to take me there. All these nights like that, you think about uh, this is where it's worth it, dad. There's, there's the, 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 the opportunity for me now to go and play professional and then to get invited into the our Hall of Fame. It's more for your, your, your mum and dad as well to say thanks very much, you give me the chance and give the rewards. Yeah. It's time for us to almost wrap up, uh, but before we do that, um, is there a message you'd like to share with the fans of each club, uh, Rovers and Dundee? Uh, any final thoughts for the fans? I know the, the Rovers and Dundee, Dundee fans. Yeah, I, I was very lucky to play for both clubs. Um, Dun, the two of them are massive clubs in my eyes. When you go over and you, and you see the, when I went over to Starks Park for the first time, you see the floodlights and you go up the top of the hill and you go into the stadium. Um, I, I couldn't believe how, how big a club it was for me to go and play there every week. I, I loved it. Um, the Rovers fans were great to me. It was unusual when you went to a stadium at that time where the fans would be behind the goals one half and then you'd come out the second half and they'd, they'd walk around and they're, they're behind the goals at the other end. I used to find that strange, but I used to love it because it, they were behind the goals that you're shooting all the time. So that, that was unusual for me, but I used to love my time playing at Starks. Um, and then when I went to Dundee as well to play full time, got a chance to play full time uh, again for a massive club. I've been really lucky, uh, and again the fans were so good to me. They got right behind me for day one, um, and, and I managed to score goals in the big games for them. It, it, it hopefully put a smile on their faces. So, no, very very thankful. When you look back at your career and you, you see the clubs that you played for, I've been very lucky to play for two big clubs at Rafe and Dundee, uh, who were well supported and and. Very lucky the fans got right behind me. Great. Well, well thanks for that, Keith. Uh, we'll say goodbye and thanks. Uh, good luck for the future. And let's hope to see you back coaching and doing your job again very soon uh, when uh, when this latest lockdown clears, whenever that is. Uh, thanks very much for having me on and, and all the best. Thank you.